Welcome to the third season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. During the holiday season, we're featuring a recap of Murder in 20's most intriguing episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. It's June and the leaves have burst open as the trees bask in the sunshine. Night falls, and the street lights twinkle as the city sleeps. But in Fairbanks, Alaska, they see no darkness. For 70 days in the spring and summer, they see 24 hours of daylight. And during winter in January, Fairbanks only gets four hours of light a day. This episode takes us back to 1989. The population of Fairbanks was around 30,000 and has remained at that number for the last 40 years. There was one murder in Fairbanks that year, the murder of high school student Johnny Jackson. Johnny had a warm smile, dark eyes, and perfectly perched eyebrows. A Pacific Standard article by his high school friend, Elizabeth Fairfield Stokes, tells of a young man who talked to everyone, ignoring the usual separation of social groups. He liked to wear black and white checkered vans on his big feet, feet that he hadn't yet grown into. After graduation, he went on to work as a cook at a local restaurant. Another young man attending high school in Fairbanks was Byron Parati. He was 16, an athletic sophomore who reveled in being the class clown. And he knew how to get his peers' attention. He once dragged an old sofa into the school and set it up in front of the bleachers. When a school assembly was held, Byron stretched out on that sofa and got a good laugh. Byron was infatuated with his girlfriend and went beyond the usual public displays of affection by surprising her with flowers and stuffed animals at school. At night, after his parents went to sleep, he borrowed their car to sneak out and visit her. But when his father found out, he threatened to call the police if he did it again. And Byron did, and true to his word, His father reported him. Byron's girlfriend had dated Johnny briefly the year before. One day at school, she was overheard telling a friend that Johnny had sexually assaulted her. A school official overheard the conversation and reported it to police. They questioned her, but she declined to press charges. Around the school, the student's census was that it wasn't true. It was a secret everyone knew, but didn't feel the need to talk about. It was pushed aside as they got on with their busy lives. The fact or fiction, believed or not, the event provided the catalyst Byron needed to defend his girlfriend's honor. And to do that, he needed to exact revenge. Byron went on a tirade against Johnny, confronting him and telling him he was going to kill him. He stalked him and followed him. Byron told everyone at school of his intention to murder Johnny, his friends, Johnny's friends, but no one took him seriously. They thought he'd see the truth eventually, 
and he almost did. Doubt had started to creep in, and Byron talked to his parents about it, wondering if the assault had even happened. Court records reported that in May, he wrote a letter to his girlfriend. This may sound egotistical and possessive, but he took something that was mine. It was and is a part of me. It was like he did it to me. Even though I don't know what happened or exactly how much he hurt you, but he stole something that is very precious to me. Something that cannot be returned. I want it back. And by doing what I'm going to do, I will gain something that is equally precious to him. As fall moved in, the leaves turned orange, fluttered to the cold ground, and left the tree limbs barren, braced and ready for the frigid winter ahead. Johnny went on with his life, but the same couldn't be said for Byron. Over the months, his revenge intensified, and his parents noticed that he had become angry. The cheerful colored lights of Christmas were snuffed and stored away. It was January 4th, 1989, a Wednesday, and the temperature in Fairbanks was unusually cold. Down to minus 25 at night, there was light precipitation with a dusting of snow. The sun set early by 3 p.m. Johnny was at work cooking at the restaurant. When he left after his shift, he was met by Byron in the parking lot, holding a 22 handgun. Byron kidnapped Johnny and forced him into his car. He drove down Lanthrop Street, straight to the town of Honor River, three miles away. There, he held Johnny hostage in his car for an hour and a half. Johnny likely tried to calm him down, to talk him out of it. Byron ordered Johnny out of the car and forced him to walk to an island a hundred yards away in the middle of the river. Byron raised his hand and pointed the gun at Johnny's head. In the dark of night, two loud shots rang out. Johnny dropped to the ground, dead at 18. Byron attempted to set his body on fire. When that didn't work, he stuffed his body under a mound of dirt along the riverbank. He removed Johnny's bank card from his wallet and used it at an ATM to steal $80. Then he contacted a friend and told him what he'd done and asked him to help him move Johnny's car to the airport to make it look like he'd left town. But his friend refused. That night, Johnny was reported missing Johnny's disappearance made the news on the local radio station. A witness had seen him getting into a vehicle that wasn't his. Over the next few days, Byron didn't try to hide the fact that he'd executed Johnny in cold blood. In fact, he bragged to his friends about the murder, saying that he didn't regret it because Johnny deserved to die and that when I shot him and I saw the look in his face I've never been so happy in my life but at the same time I was sick to my stomach the school and the community were buzzing about Johnny it's not unusual for people in Fairbanks to go missing in 2020, there were 41 people reported missing, and from experience, the locals knew it wasn't a good sign. 
although surrounded by vast wilderness with numerous bodies of water and wild animals, the missing are often murdered. Crime rate in the small town was high. CrimeGrade.org states that 91% of cities in the U.S. are safer than Fairbanks. The friend that Byron asked to help move Johnny's car contacted police. They obtained a warrant and arranged to record a phone conversation between Byron and his friend. And Byron did not disappoint. He shared all the grisly details. The Daily Sitka Sentinel reported that Byron chuckled and said to his friend, Believe me now, I'll take you out there this summer. We'll have a party. On Sunday morning, Byron attended church. It had been four days since Johnny disappeared. That afternoon, his friend arranged a meeting at his father's car dealership. The building was dark as officers crouched behind desks. When Byron walked in, they stood up, pointed their guns at him, and ordered him to freeze. Byron was arrested. Police searched his home and found the murder weapon, ammunition, and a list of supplies. They also found news articles about Johnny's disappearance. Byron was charged with kidnapping, first-degree murder, robbery, and tampering with evidence. After Johnny's funeral, the town went quiet, the silence deafening. People didn't know what to say when one of their teens murdered another. So they said nothing, and life in Fairbanks continued on. Court records reported that the judge ordered Byron to undergo a psychological and psychiatric evaluation. The records determined that if Byron was placed in a facility that addressed his needs, he had less than 50% chance of rehabilitation and that he was not capable of being rehabilitated by age 20, which resulted in him being tried as an adult. Byron was held at the Fairbanks Correctional Center when he somehow managed to get up on the roof. A correctional officer spotted him as the officer reached for his radio and began to release his assault rifle, Byron jumped him. The radio flew out of his reach and the officer landed on the ground. Byron pounced, punching him in the face and knocking his glasses off. Byron struggled to wrench the rifle away from the officer but he wasn't about to let go and screamed for help. Then the officer's jacket rode up, revealing a pistol he stored on his belt. The pistol wasn't loaded, but Byron didn't know that. He grabbed it and stepped back, letting go of the rifle. In that split second, the officer went to fire a warning shot. When he realized... The magazine had fallen out. Byron now realized that the gun he held had no bullets. He apologized to the officer and surrendered. In October, ten months after Johnny's murder, Byron entered a plea of no contest to first-degree murder. In exchange for his guilty plea, the state would drop the charges for kidnapping, robbery, and tampering with evidence. At sentencing, Byron's lawyer asked the court for leniency and to not throw his young life away. Byron took the stand and told the judge, I guess the only thing I've come to ask for is that you punish me, not kill me. 
His voice was calm as he continued to say he was a bright kid driven by his emotions for love and hate. The prosecution asked for the maximum sentence for a murder that was planned and that Byron should be held accountable for his adult actions when committing an adult crime. Superior Court Judge J. Hodges agreed and sentenced Byron to 99 years. He would be eligible for parole after serving 33 years. Byron was incarcerated at the Spring Creek Correctional Center in nearby Seward, a maximum security prison that was built a year earlier to house violent offenders, many who will never step outside its walls. Byron's schoolmate Elizabeth visited him in jail, and although there were rumors that his girlfriend had recanted, Byron told her, I didn't kill him because he raped her. I killed him because he wouldn't go away. In 1990, Byron was convicted on the attempted escape and assault on the corrections officer and sentenced to 15 years, bringing his total to 114 years. Byron appealed his sentence. In 1991, his parents testified that their son attempted suicide while in jail and that he doubted his girlfriend's story and was angry. But the Superior Court judge believed Byron was cold, calculated, and unremorseful, and resentenced the 19 year old to 99 years. Back at the Spring Creek Correctional Center, 24 year old Byron wasn't content serving his time. He and another violent inmate, Christopher Marcy, who'd been convicted of murder burglary and sexual assault, and was serving his sentence of 139 years, had heard that the prisoner's alarm system wasn't working. The two men had nothing to lose, and used this information to their advantage. On March 14, 1994, they cut a hole in the fence and escaped. By 11.31 that night, they had been reported. Immediately, police set up roadblocks around Seward and went house to house talking to residents. They set up road checkpoints, the Coast Guard checked boat traffic, and a helicopter was brought in. Boxed in by law enforcement and Alaska's unforgiving icy cold, the two convicts surrendered within a day. In a statement Byron made years later, he said his punishment for escaping was nine years in solitary confinement. After Byron's resentencing, Johnny's mother told the press that it gave her faith in the legal system and she hoped that it would show kids how one lie can destroy many lives and hoped that the sentence would deter other kids from taking the law into their own hands. But in the end, she said, but no sentence will bring my son back. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. We'll be back January 11, 2023 with another year of interesting and captivating true crime podcasts. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Rodney Halbauer. He was narcissistic and mean and was serving time by the age of 15. In 1975, he committed a violent assault, but was released on bail until his trial. He used that time to go on a killing spree that terrorized two states. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fastlane Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. 
If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them, or not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.